Now, if you look at page 81, as we dive into the, uh, the content here, uh, once again, I think you're noticing a theme. We are, we are essentially going to give you a horizontal chart of every book of the Bible, which is really helpful when you're studying the Bible yourself. If you notice what Judges, the book of Judges is, now we have an unfortunate way of thinking about this. When we hear the word judge in kind of Western culture, we think of old men or women sitting with robes and a gavel in like a very sterile clinical courtroom environment. It's really not what the judges are. The judges are military warriors. They are prophets, kind of. They are, they are judges. They act, they dispense justice. They're military leaders, kind of. They're kind of this weird you know, collection of different ideas, but definitely don't think stuffy old dude with a gavel sitting in a courtroom somewhere. That's not what we're talking about. And if you're a young judge out there watching this, sorry, that's the thing that comes to my mind. But uh, here's the chart. If you notice it, we have some introductory material or prologue for the book of Judges. And then we have essentially stories of the judges playing out chapters 3 to 16. Now, what makes this section difficult is it's not chronological. The stories are not told chronologically. And so they actually, some of them may even overlap. And if you remember, we've said this several different times, this is not a nation at this point. This is a bunch of loosely connected tribes that are living in a scattered, kind of in a scattered land called Israel. They're going in trying to take territory. And as they're doing so, they're going to find themselves experiencing opposition from the people around them. And they're going to need somebody to come in and be a, a, a helpful deliverer. So think more like the Wild West, like a Western movie of like the American Western frontier in the 1800s. That's what we're looking at more than like a nation with a military and a central government. And so these stories are just a random collection of stories that are trying to tell a theological point. It's why I'm calling this the downward spiral movement. The, pur the purpose of the book of Judges is to, is to show how bad things are getting in Israel. And here's why we know that. The author of the book of Judges included the last four, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, five chapters of what I just call the appendix. I tell people in the class, don't read the appendix. Don't look at it. It's bizarre. It's weird, which is a little bit of reverse psychology because I want you to. But notice the point of the story. The point of the book of Judges is to show how bad things are. It is not saying, look at these awesome people, be like them. It's a downward spiral into the, prow the, into the power of sin, ending with, so these stories end like this. This appendix tells two stories. One is of uh, basically a person getting raped to death and then being dismembered and having the, her, her body parts sent to the 12 tribes. There's a fun story. And the second one is of civil war, also fun. The point, look how bad it's getting. And if you notice the, comp the, the comparison at the bottom of that page, Joshua was the high water mark of the people of Israel. The, the nation seems to genuinely trust Yahweh. That Remember the generation that grew up wandering because their parents failed at Kadesh Barnea? That generation seems to genuinely trust Joshua's leadership and Yahweh at their, at their helm. The book of Judges will be the exact opposite. And what we're going to see is it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Turn the page. On page 82, we're going to move really quickly through this. What you can see is all of these things that, that, uh, that, that we're noting here are backdrops for these first couple pages. Look at what we start in page 82. Yahweh said to Joshua, When the Lord had given rest to Israel from all the surrounding enemies, and Joshua was old, Joshua, Joshua says, look at verse 4, Behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes those nations that remain. Now, go in, finish the job, trust me, I'll drive those nations back. The Lord your God, verse 5, will push them back before you. He'll drive them out of your sight. Trust Yahweh, He'll drive the nations away. But look at page 83. Be strong to keep and do all that is written. It's faithfulness to Torah that will enable your success. If you disobey Torah, I won't drive the nations about. Look at verse 12, middle of that paragraph. If you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them, with them and they with you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive these nations out. Essentially, Joshua is saying this, 
Trust Yahweh, it'll go well for you. Don't trust Yahweh, it'll go poorly. And I expect Joshua to say that because that's exactly what Moses had said in the book of Deuteronomy. Same idea. And what we're going to see is, as the story of the judges begins, they fail to trust Yahweh. They refuse to drive the nations out. And that will begin for us this period of the downward spiral, which is printed for you on page 84. Uh, the, the, we're going to look in a minute at where we see this and how it's worded biblically, but to make it easier, remember it's five R's. The sin cycle is five R's. They begin in a good place of blessing or rest. And what happens is they will commit rebellion against God. The way that the biblical author will, will, will write it is this, that the people did evil in the sight of Yahweh. Next, happen, next, what almost always happens is God brings discipline or retribution in the form of oppressing peoples around them will come in and attack them. They will begin finally to cry out, Yahweh, we can't do this. These, they're hurting us. They're oppressing us. And we call that repentance. And then God raises up one of these military leaders called judges who will come defeat the oppressing power and restore them to right relationship. Back to rest. So rest, rebellion, retribution, repentance, Restoration. That's the five R's of the sin cycle. And you can see on page 85, this is the biblical language for those five R's. And I want you to see, uh, turn to page 86. You can see it all in one story with the story of Othniel on page 86. Uh, it says number four, illustrated specifically Othniel. Take a look at it here. The Israelites write the word rebellion, did evil. There it is. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. What did they do? They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the, the Baals and the Asherahs. Uh, the Canaanites had all sorts of gods that were around them. And these gods, they had gods for fertility, gods for the, oat, for the sea, God for uh, the sun, gods for the wind, God for weather. God, there was a God for everything in the ancient culture. And that's what, what made the Israelites so different is they claimed that there was one God who was supreme over all the other gods. There is one God who there is no other God like. But in growing up in a culture where there were gods for everything, it became very diff it was it was very difficult for the Israelites to be faithful to just Yahweh because there were gods they believed there were gods for everything in the ancient culture. And what we're going to see is they will frequently go and worship and serve these other gods. And it makes sense for them. That's what they assume they're supposed to do. But Yahweh keeps saying, be faithful to me and only me. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of, and it's hard to pronounce these names, but I want you to write next to sold them, retribution. God sends oppressive nations. But when they cried out, there's repentance to the Lord. He raised up a deliverer. There's restoration. And you're writing all these things, by the way. Rebellion next to did evil. Retribution next to sold them. Repentance next to cried out. Restoration next to saved them. He raised up Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. Look at verse 11. So the land had peace, rest. We're returning back to rest. Here's the five R's once again on page 87. And we're looking at this sin cycle in the book of uh, Judges, but we can also apply that in the New Testament period. This is what our fellowship with Yahweh through Jesus with the indwelling Holy Spirit often looks like. This sin cycle as a type becomes instructive for us as followers of Jesus in the New Testament era. Notice it with us. It foreshadows the believer's daily walk, or we might say our fellowship with God. And I think what would be a really helpful study is to take page 87, 88, and 89 and to do a personal quiet time on those and, and to examine your own life. Uh, examine what does that rebellion look like in your life to trust in the idols of the culture around us. Remember, just like the Israelites, it was natural. Of course they're going to these other gods. Of course they're looking to them to help. We do that same thing in our culture now with money and sex and power. We do the same thing with our own reputation. We do the same thing with a whole host of things around us. We trust in political leaders. We trust in political parties. We trust in our own ability as Americans to pull ourselves out of it. And so frequently we find ourselves 
uh, looking very much like the culture around us. And what Yahweh, what God would call it is, that's rebellion against me. It's a failure to trust me. And so what does it look like if you would take to take this, these, these three pages as a model in a quiet time and do some self-examination in your life? That this sin cycle, can, it foreshadows our experience of our own fellowship with God, even in the New Testament era. So let me encourage you to try that as a, uh, as a quiet time in the next week.